thing you should have. That's what separates going out and being a one-trick pony and catching a few fish from absolutely being a murderer and the elite guys in the sea. So this right, right here is basically everything I use. I don't get overly complicated. I got my favorite go-tos. This would be like what I would call like plan B, plan C. Plan B being the jigging, plan C. And I usually, well, you can talk about this, but the... And, and literally, this will cover everything that I do. Whether it's micro butters, you know, some, you know, if they're on butters, you got this, you got that, down deep. The bronze is great, you know, do you obviously. like that uh, hook style versus the stiff one? What's your preference? For, for I, the I, I like this one. Bigger, yeah. I like this one. I personally like that one better. And the too. reason why, when you got a bigger fish and then this heads against the face, yeah. the hook moves and you don't, you, you'll, you'll pull I, less hooks. I, I say 100 pound and under, you can go with the owner stiff rig. Right. I feel like it, it you just hooks better. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this one, you really got to get a good hook set, but on a giant or something bigger, that swing hook definitely. And so, then. Yeah, if you don't have those Ronzies in your quiver, you're What's right a good amount of tails and heads to have on, on your boat just to be prepared to do this? At, at least two packs of each. Like at, if you, at, at a minimum. Right, at a minimum. That, I'm saying minimum. You're going to blow that in a day on fish. Of course, yes. exactly. And if, and if you, it depends where you're fishing. If you're fishing Rhode Island, you might want to have green and pink. If you're fishing the Cape, you're going to want silver and white. You know, silver and white's going to work in Rhode Island, too. You're going to want to have all four. But for whatever reason, the greens and the pinks and the brighter colors aren't as good on the Cape as they are in Rhode Island. And then lately, recently, Hoagie started making these bigger, like eight, they're like eight and a half ounce harness jigs. This is something here when the fish are really down deep or really windy days and the, and the current's just too strong or, or they're just that deep, where you can get this down deep and present it well where this won't. This will scope out, it's just not heavy enough. And one thing I like about this, I've hooked a lot of really big fish on this. See how far the hook is away from the swivel? You rarely get chafed on big fish when you hook them with this. Very rarely. And then obviously the sirens, you know, you got the really small when they're on the butterfish. And then, what size rods, reels, line, and leader are you fishing on the sirens? So for the sirens, it depends what I'm fishing. If I'm fishing something small like this for the Let's butterfish. Let's talk about like Rhode Island at two, the gully to the claw. <coughs> gully to the claw, you could, you, you probably, yeah, 14K for sure. 14K, you know, 150 to 200 gram popping rod. Um, so I, longer popping rods or shorter popping rods? Longer, longer cast. Longer, yeah. So like an eight foot stick? Eight, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I love the Dead Eye, which he doesn't—he you know, doesn't make anymore because he can get the blanks. It's a really light rod, a lot of backbone. Um, Shimano Grappler. Grappler. The grappler we have exactly. up here. Exactly. Um, the Grappler rod is kind of designed for fishing both the Duranzis and the Sirens. 14K, and I'll typically rig one. I'll have di different leaders. I'll have one with a 50-pound leader, one with a 65-pound leader, one with an 80-pound leader. You know, I'll, I'll throw the 80 primarily because you never know what size fish you're going to hook, but on those days where you're, you're throwing the 80 into them over and over and over again, yep. you, you want to go yeah, down to the 65, even sometimes 40. I'll go down to 40 if I have to. See, like those raging feeds, like in the spring, like June, like out at like Regal Sword or something. Right. And you're casting poppers and you're casting rods them and they're just snubbing it. No bite. Sometimes you just cast something like this on like 60 fluoro. Right. And just let it sit there. And if they just pick it up. Exactly. Instant, I mean, exactly. That was that day you told me. Yeah. You're like, dude, I was out there, go down, and I, I rigged 50 that night, yep. got out there, and we got we got tied a bunch of times. That was like when the coin bro went off. Yeah. When the coin bro went off, we were running down, and we were using a lot of that small the stuff. small stuff yep. on the backside of all the rays. Yep. So, so this would be a good application where maybe you see the whales. Right. I don't know. How do you usually do? You blind fish the sirens, or are you fishing on it's birds? No, it's usually on birds. Yeah. Birds. Birds are the biggest thing. Birds um, all out just busting feeds. Yeah, all busting feeds. You know, and that's, in my opinion, one of the keys to being successful in top water tuna fishing is the birds. When you learn how to read the life and read the birds to know what they're doing, because you can come up on some life, and you come up with some birds. And there are subtle signs that the birds do that you just know there's fish there. What are those signs? That everything from run. looking down, yeah, looking down, or you can see a bird, if there's a bird really up high, so if you got a flock of birds low and there's one bird way up high, why is he way up high? He's up high because there's fish down deep. He's going up to get a better look. There's no reason for him to be high when all the action's on the water. Or fish looking down. One of the other keys are when there's actually fish getting ready to feed, you'll see the birds and they're all kind of like aimlessly flying around. And then all of a sudden they're in unison. 
and you start to see like the dark undersides as they all turn together and you just and you just know you just see them and you know they're following fish and the key when that's happening is get ahead of them they're looking down they see the bait ball they see the fish pushing it and the fish are pushing it to the surface because they want to eat it near the surface they want to trap those fish near the surface where the bait can't get away and then birds see it long before we do Get ahead of them. Get out ahead of those birds that are starting to come together. And when you get them down low and they're like running together almost like they're actually like they're leapfrogging out, each they're, other. They're That's leapfrogging another, each another other. one, yep. And they're headed in one direction. Everyone makes the mistake of like pounding right at the bird. No. And, yeah, I, way and, out and you want to be like way, way, way out in front of that. How far is way, way, way out in front of them? Like 50, 50, yeah, I was going to say 50, 60 feet. Right. On the yeah. other side of like. Yeah, don't cast at the bird. Cast yeah, in cast, front of cast in front right. of them because they're all jogging together. They're actually telling you where that, that bait's going to be. Right. More times than not, I've, you see that and you see all the boats beelining straight for it. <laughs> and you'll see me do a big giant loop. Come around, come off the throttles, the feed pops up, we get tight, and everybody's looking they like, all stand up they look at me up. like, where the hell's he going? I'm going to get tight. So <laughs> when you roll up to a feed like that, do you usually, like everyone on the rod, everyone on the boat grab a rod and start throwing, or do you have a predetermined no, no, no. sequence? So what's gonna what I usually do is I'll, I'll be set up and I'll have two rods ready on the, on this, on the right side on the, uh, of the gunnel. And then I have everybody back, and when we roll up on the feed, the first guy grabs a rod, gets up and casts, goes to the left. Next guy comes up from him, goes up to the left. Do that with three guys, and then usually at that time, I'm looking <laughs> behind us or off the gun, you know, off the stern, and I'm usually grabbing a rod and backhanding because if they miss it three times and it's coming this way, they're going to be there. I'll fire a cast off the stern, and <clears throat> times and I'll get tight doing that. So you discuss what's going to happen before you actually. Absolutely. We usually, and he, he, he could tell you, he's been with me before. We'll go out, I'll get to the area right before we get to the, like, the actual tuna grounds where we're going to start having a chance to see a fish. I'll come off the, you know, come off the throttle and I'll say, guys, this is what's going on. This is what we're going to do. This is what we might see. This is how you're going to react. You know, it, it's, it, as a captain, it's your job, whether you're a charter captain or just a recreational captain, to, to keep everybody focused and in the right direction at all times. You're, you're the captain of the ship. And if you keep everybody focused and you tell them what to do and how to do it, that's how you're successful. So do you ever use the Ronzi's and the Siren and Topwater stuff at the same time? Or is oh, it usually sure. one and then the other? So I, I tend to go towards Topwater. That's what I love to do. But more times than not, and it's another thing of being aware of your surroundings, we'll run up on a feed a couple times and not get tight, and every time we run up on the feed, we're mocking fish. So I say, guys, next time we run up on a feed, one of you guys, you know, as they're casting up the bow, drop the rods off the side, and you will we'll get tight many or times even doing dead it. Stick one. Dead stick and it. And you're fishing on what kind of boat? I go 28 Blue Water. So it's a center, center console. console. So big game. You guys are fishing on a sport fish boat. Do you guys use the jig and pop style stuff? Because you have to every run day. it every day. But you have to run a different kind of program because you're running from a sport fish boat, right? Yeah, right. All off the corner. Right. Yeah, good. Yeah. All right. We, I mean, we do like a bunch of different things. I mean, um, depending on what's going on with the bite, our mates hate us because usually somebody's driving from up the bridge and we'll go from trolling to jig and pop. We'll fish dead baits, live baits. It kind of depends on what's going on. And really it's, um, and I kind of missed some of this because I was outside talking to Ralph. So if I'm repeating myself, I apologize. But I mean, I guess the one thing is we're really not complacent. If the troll's not working, we're going to switch it up. We're going to throw some jigs down there. Um, you know, the Ron Z stuff, a lot of dead stick and Ron's. Like with us, like we're, we're fishing in a smaller cockpit. We can't really spread out like you can, like on a big down east run center console. So we'll usually have maybe like five guys jigging. Um, one of us will be up in the bridge. We'll drop a Ron's down, just dead stick it. Um, if I'm not sure if you guys talked about dead stick and the Rons. If you haven't Talk done it, that yeah. yeah I mean, like, oh, it's funny. Like, one of the first things we always get in the water is a Rons. And while we're getting other stuff set up, like let's say we're going to chunk, we'll, have, we'll put the Rons down first while we're getting baits on hooks. And, and nine times out of ten, the thing just sitting there dead stick with the rock into the boat, it gets bit. Do you have a and color and size on the jig you prefer? Um, the jigs, so we, we fish a lot of the Daiwa SK jigs, and for us, like, the, the pink, silver, purple combo is, like, lights out. It outfishes, like, pretty much every jig that we have, and we'll put that thing out there all the time. It always gets hit. Do you want to pull a few of them? I'll go get yeah, it yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, because I'm going to get a couple. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're, they're freaking lights out. I mean, if you guys don't have those, add them to your arsenal. 
like the uh, the 70 gram, the 110, and I believe it's like the 180 gram. So on the Ron Z dead stick, yep. which is when you were saying dead stick, you yeah. mean you drop it down there, you lock it up, you just leave it alone, right? Yep. Pretty much, yeah. Drop, like a lot of times we'll be marking stuff down deep. Um, you know, we'll put it, we'll drop down to the bottom, bring it up a couple cranks and let it just kind of sit sit out there and do its thing. The rocking of the boat actually jigs the, jigs the Rons. Do, do you have um, a color that you prefer? I mean, a lot of times it's like that silver, this that one. kind of chartreuse color, um, Katy Perry, a white. You know, I mean, we we have a bunch of different ones that we put out. You know, it's kind of different every day. But what size leader do you usually fish on? We're usually usually we fish pretty light stuff, like sixty I mean, to eighty. Sixty to eighty. You know, I mean, we. I'd rather get the bites, and lose the fish, than not get the bites. You know, so a lot of the st a lot of the time we're fishing like a 60 pound leader. Do you, you, know? do you guys keep like a lot of gear rigged on the boat ready to go? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So chunk I mean, stuff, troll stuff, we, everything. So, so everything. Every, yeah. So every trip when we leave, um, you know, like our trolling gear is down. You know, if if we're gonna go troll to start, our trolling gear is down in the cockpit, and then the whole bridge. You know, the, the rocket launchers in the bridge is all our spinning gear. And it's and all then rigged, ready to go. It's all rigged anytime. and ready to go. So, you know, like our mates, we get down to the boat an hour before the trip. The mates get all the stuff out. They cut off all the leaders, put new leaders on all the spinning gear. Because um, a lot of times it's like what you were saying before. Bang, we're on the troll. Like, I can't count how many times we were, especially in the canyon. We're on the troll bite. We're on, we're still marking fish, and you drop a jig. And next thing you know it, it's nonstop on the jig. And yeah. the, you know, and now now you went from you know trolling catching one or two to like you said before, you got five or six guys on all tight at the same time. <clears throat> so so yeah, just to say something to like the crowd, you know, even if you don't have a boat but you love to fish and you're a guest on a boat, a lot of times I like to bring outfits that are rigged and ready to go because sometimes the boat doesn't have that stuff ready to go. So be an asset anytime you're on a boat and being an asset. You know, like one of my most favorite guys I love to fish with is Michael Grant. This dude shows up with 400 pounds of bags worth of like every color, every size, every size leader. He's got everything ready to go. But just, you know, I wanted to drive home, like having your gear on the boat, ready to go. Lots of different styles of ways to fish. That's super. Right. Yeah. I mean, like there's there's so many Game times change. we're steaming out and you're, you're like, okay, this is where we're gonna go start the day. And on the way out, you run into fish up on the surface 20 miles from where you're gonna, you're planning on going, and you know, to be able to th drop a jig or throw a plug at them or something, um, you know, it's to not have that stuff ready. You're yeah. just like, by the time yeah. you rig everything up and go find your your poppers or what happened, like the fight's over, you know. So just to have all that stuff ready, yeah, I mean, I mean that's the way tuna fishing is. You could you could have five minutes out of the whole day that you that you can have success. But like know? this specific so. color, we probably do. A hot, we probably go through over a, like hundreds, yeah. like hundreds of these. Like things. Ralph's tackle shop in there, like our tackle room is like we have all different sizes just of, of this stuff, like so we know what it is. And another thing too, like just mentioning, like I don't know if you guys talked about this, but like our tackle room, we buy we we pre -st buy stuff every year just so we know what we have because we take the stuff off the boat and then you get complacent. You're like, oh, it's time to go fishing again. And then you like find all the shit that you just pulled off the boat and you just bought like $500 worth of it. So like we've done that. So now like everything is organized. We know what we have. We know what we need to re-rig. So come fishing time, whether it's inshore or offshore, you know, we know what we have in inventory and then we rig it up. It's ready to go for that particular trip. Like we don't buy anything really during the season. That's already done. It's all finished. We own everything right now. People should take note of that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> no, because oh, I, well, I, I agree. For, for one I agree. reason during the season is, all right, so if that's the hot jig and everyone's buying it, you can't find it anywhere. Oh, yep. So it happens. No. We get that here all the time. Right. All the time. It those those up. Mad Mantis poppers last year, yeah. they yeah. were gone immediately. Right. And right. then everybody's like, where are they? I'm like, sorry, yeah. dude. Like, yeah. what do you what do you want so, from I mean, us? We try to, we try to pre-buy all of our stuff during the year, then you can have an inventory it too. You know what you're running low on. You can put an order into the tackle shop and get the stuff. So when you, if you run out, you can, you have it. You know. Yeah. How so, how like early in the season do you guys start your rigging? We basically start when we stop fishing. You know, like so we, you know, the tuna fishing. You know, we fish until the weather 
you know, until the fish are gone, you know. And right. then everything gets and then stripped we, we, off, we, sent back out for repair. And we make note, it's like, okay, we need to order this, we need to order this. Some of the stuff, like, we'll buy at that time, some of the stuff will wait. I mean, obviously, you know, in October when we're done tuna fishing, we don't need it, you know, until really, you know, June the following year. June's kind of when we start tuna fishing, but, you know, we'll start pre-buying and, in you know. November, December. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, you know, our, you know, we buy a lot of stuff over the winter and we service all of our stuff and we have an ungodly amount of tackle to as go much through. Yeah, we have, you know, 48 inshore reels and, and you know, 50 offshore reels between spinning gear and trolling gear that we have to go through all of them and respool them and, you know, so it's it's a lot to do. So that's why we start when we, when we stop. It's, you know, everything gets respooled every year, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, does anybody here have any questions so far, specifically about the way you fish, or any questions that we to help kind of gap? These guys gave me a great tip last year. I don't remember it, but they said whether, <laughs> whether you're popping or trolling, when the fish is on, they're boarding the fish. You guys dropping jigs down. Oh, right, yeah, every yeah. Time. yeah, yeah. And that paid off. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, really like off. all those pelagic fish that you know, usually if there's one, there's multiple fish with them. You know, and uh, you might not see them, but you know, you drop you drop some jigs down deep when you're fighting the fish. That's where your count goes way up. Right. Like your your daily count of how many fish you had. Like when you start doing that, you'll be like a three or four tuna guy to like. I got when you hear a guy who's like, I got 15 today. You know what I mean? It, it's that's I that's mean, the truth. Do you do that the canyon too? Oh, yeah. yeah. How deep do you go? I mean, like. I know the gully. You say you drop. You know, you know. I mean, when we're, when we're fishing the canyon and we're 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 targeting tuna, like our sound there, we're not really looking below 600 feet because, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get anything down there. I mean, deep. most of the fish that are coming up, they're gonna be they're gonna be up anyway. And even if you hook one, there may be a school of. I mean, who knows, 20 to maybe 100 fish that you may not hook. So usually what we'll do, the boat's still moving when you hook the fish. Just kind of grab the jig, kind of like pitch it up tight. It's going to sink down and let it drop for maybe, maybe 30 seconds. And then all you have to do is really just lock up the reel, come tight on it. When the thing comes tight, you usually get hooked up. You don't even have to jig it. So. Yeah. A lot of times they hit on the, when the jig is falling. You know, they'll grab it when it's falling. What would be your, if you want to leave on like a, a Friday at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, say, and you're going to go for a game trip for the weekend, what would be your game plan? I mean, mo most of the time, like, you know, it, let's say we were going to run and the, the, you know, the, the bites in West Atlantis. We get out there, um, we usually troll the afternoon bite all the way through the dark. We usually troll until like 11 o'clock at night. You know, and then we'll set up and chunk and sort of fish at night. Um, like just before first light in the morning, we, we usually put, you know stop chunking and get back up on the troll. You but know, we're trolling. Then, we're trolling again in the dark. Yeah, I mean, we do. We we troll like get a lot of big eyes. You know, after after dark. Um, so we'll, you know, and then we'll our troll. customers love mahi. So do we. So yeah. no matter what, like. When we're done doing the, the troll, the, that other troll or a little deep drop, then we transition over, grab all our mahi on the way in, and then that's that's pretty much the wrap. But. And that's all different sets of gear for all the yeah, yeah, it is. Right. So the the mahi stuff is, is literally that, like our, our straight bass gear and you know light, light tackle stuff, like fluke gear and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, if we could just drive one thing home, it's, you know, if there's a gap in your tackle, if there's a gap in the size, now's the time to kind of get that stuff detailed in. Because once the tune, I mean, I don't know what you guys have seen already, but like from the bait we've already seen, I mean, we have, I mean, Robbie's calling me and like, like a month ago, like they're here. <laughs> like guys are marking the giants, you know, the commercial fisher are already marking the tunas. Like it's gonna be a killer year. The baits here in numbers I've I mean I can't remember a season where you've seen baits. It's insane. Like this. It's insane. And everyone gets out earlier now, so you can finally get to see what's really happening. You know? You can't hide it anymore. I used to be like April's dead. You know, you need to fish. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean look you got to be ready, but I mean, back to the point. I mean, look at they 
like they, he was alluding to before, having all your rods rigged and stuff like that, it's because you. how many times has that been the one shot that you get, too? That's it. Yeah. And, you there. Were, and when Drew they popped out up, there and it's like, oh, you were yeah, ready. We, like, I've always said, just because you put that waypoint in your GPS, that doesn't mean where you're fishing. Right. Because you're going out there and you run into something and then you're dicking around trying to get all your stuff ready, then it's over. Then it's like, you look like a total clown in front of your customers. Well, it's like Toulouse so. said, like you do a whole trip and you turn around and you're steaming home. And next thing you know it, you had a bad, you had a, we all have bad days. You had a bad day. And next thing you know it, like you're, you're, you're 20 miles from home. And all of a sudden this huge epic feed happens. And next thing you know, it, you just had a stellar day. That's right. It, it, yep. it, you go but if you're just steaming home and your right. stuff's put away, you know, like it's like even our trolling gear, our trolling gear is out ready on the deck within. Yeah. We, we pull out of the dock, like everything's rigged, ready to go sit on the deck. All the yeah. ballyhoo, like they're right there. Everything's rigged, ready. All the no, bars, it's wherever it's gonna go. So no, because you could you could roll up on a feed while you're steaming, right. and it's throw never every, over till it's over. You throw That's everything right. in the water, and next thing you know, that could have been your only visible shot for and the even day. Even if you're not gonna go out there, the intentions of popping, it's good to have it. I mean, I don't consider my boat a, a nice run and gun boat, you know, compared to like. I want to go wherever he went to. You know what I mean? Like that's not the primary way, primary way I'm going to fish. But I got poppers ready. Yeah. Because every once in a while, sometimes that <laughs> slow boat, I'm going real slow, and it's just they pop up right there, and it's like, oh, that's convenient. I didn't have to chase them down. Well, there was a day Lou and I were out this year. Remember <clears throat> trolling the poppers? Oh, it's awesome. We were so freaking tired. We were just like, just troll them. Just troll them. I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. Just troll. I'm like, we're catching these things on the troll. We're trolling poppers now? This doesn't even look right, but it works. That was awesome. In front of a dolphin. Every battle's with that. You get in front of the dolphins, and then, you know, you get to pop them right where the dolphins were. Yeah, it's all about placement. You don't want to do it in the middle of nowhere. Just get it to go in front of the school of the dolphins. Pop, pop, Every time. Every <laughs> time. Hey, BJ. What would you tell, like, someone who's an amateur just getting in the jig and pop game? Like, what would be your best advice? Spend some money. <laughs> <laughs> At Crafty One. No, it's true. It's like the the a lot of a lot of people like get it get into it on like on cheaper gear, and and it. It, it does it hurt you. Ass. It bites you in the ass. Like not having that right combo, like having the right combo, especially like you don't know what you're gonna hook. So you end up you end up hooking, you know, a, a 250 pound fish, and you know you're fighting it on a wet noodle. You you could be there for like eight hours. I was cursed last year. I hooked yeah. three fish. Like it's time to go home. I hooked three giants on a jig last year, and it's just like, then what do you do? But we had the rods and the gear with the stopping power to stop them. I mean, granted, it took like six hours, but you know, you land the fish and you can go home. But if you if you're undergone or you got like some reel that's gonna like melt after like the first hour of fishing, you know. So I mean, as far as um, outside of the gear, you know, you kind of, with the jig and pop stuff, you get out what you put in. You know, if you, if you That's work hard, you know, and you're, and you're, and you're jigging the whole time, you know, you're, you're fishing. You know, if, if you're tired waiting, you're, you're out there with a crew of guys and there's one guy fishing and everyone else is waiting for him to get bit, you know. Yeah. Jigging's a team sport. Yeah. So, like, if, if you got a crew that's jigging, grind on the guy who's doing it wrong. And, like, and just to get them to be doing it the right way. Like, we have customers that they're come. Like, they think they're fluking. They're out there like this. I'm like, <laughs> no, you're not going to get them like that, you know? It's like, it's just, it's just bad. It's like, or it's like, it's like, okay, who's fished a spinning rod before? Then they come out, they're holding it upside down. I'm like, no, no. Okay, hold on. <laughs> now, then it's like fishing 101. You got to, like, teach them how to do it. But, you know, most of the people, you know, it is tiring when you're jigging all day, especially when you're swinging those bigger jigs. But the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. But having a variety of jigs, like, like you can grind on somebody on a heavier jig, and that might be what they need that day. But you also got to be able to transition into lighter, lighter gear, so this way they can continue to do it for five, six hours. Have you guys done any of the slow pitch stuff? Trying to incorporate a little slow pitch into that? Not really. Not, not a lot now. I find sometimes it's easier for the people that aren't coordinated. They I got the customers that you know what I mean. Like they can't get a cadence going. Yeah. At least with the slow pitch, you're doing it with the reel. So you just let the rod bounce. Mm. But it, you know that's more rods you need to have. But yeah. 
don't know if we got room. <laughs> <laughs>